the presumption at the moment is that we are all trying to build an edifice that reaches heaven a consciousness that can walk in reality and we know that no matter how high we go we're going to always require a firm foundation skyscraper will never stand if it is not rooted in the ground inflexibly and if we are going to walk consciously in other worlds than this one it's very necessary to have the foundation so firmly embedded that you can walk without wavering so we're going to call this a bread and butter class we want to be sure that every loose nut and every loose bolt is firmly fixed we want to be sure that every student knows precisely what is expected if you intend to walk consciously in the kingdom of heaven on earth now there is a passage in all of the gospels about the moment in Gethsemane when the master is taken by the servants of the high priest and there is an incident in that episode which we would like to look at to determine if it can give us another insight another depth of ourselves another principle that we can live by I'm referring to the cutting off of the ear of Malchus and only one of the gospel writers treats it in this fashion this is Luke they're in the garden of Gethsemane one of them meaning one of Jesus group smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear and Jesus answered and said meaning he answered his disciples action suffer ye thus far and he touched his ear and healed him now isn't that a strange thing to happen just think if you were that Malchus and one moment a sword sliced your ear off and a moment later it was back on again what would you make of that could you ever be the same again what about the disciples who saw it what about those who would come to take Jesus what did they think or is it possible that because it was dark very few noticed certainly the man who lost the ear and regained it quickly must have noticed it would be interesting to know more about him although we don't but what is the significance for us would you in such a moment when it would appear that your life is at stake stop to repair the ear of one who was about to try to get you killed and then how did he do it without bandaging the ear without applying any tourniquet to the body in any place without trying to stifle the flow of blood without any medication did he have a secret for us some of you have told me of incidents where you fell down and yet you really didn't fall down because as soon as you knew the truth you were standing up without having tried to even get up others have written me very interesting things about cars that disappear when they drive on the road occasionally and they go right through a car that was there without touching it do these things really happen 
Now, the Bible says that he had his ear one minute and the next minute he didn't. And let us, if we accept it as having happened, go beyond the happening in the visible and see what was happening in the invisible. What was happening in the consciousness of Jesus Christ to make this ear reappear in place that instantaneously? And how can we apply what was happening in his consciousness to our consciousness? First, we can read out of it a statement by the Master that this individual, Malchus, who was a servant of the high priest of Judaism, is a symbol of the ear of the church of that day and of this day. The ear of the church does not hear the word of God. The ear of the mind of man does not hear the word of God. That ear was cut off to show that it does not hear. It is a symbol of understanding. It is a symbol of the capacity to receive the word. And it is cut off, but it is replaced by the Christ. Power cuts it off, but Christ replaces it, restores it. And so it would appear that we are being told that the ear of the church, which this man represented as a servant of the high priest, should be replaced with another capacity, a capacity to hear the word. But how do you put back an ear that's off? beside telling us that the ear of mankind must be changed, that there must be a change of capacity from material consciousness to spiritual consciousness. Mankind needs an ear that can hear the inner word of the Father. Now, there's only one explanation that will work as to how the ear was replaced. And it doesn't make any difference how far we go in this work, we will not find another explanation other than that the ear itself is not a divine creation, is not a physical anything, is not matter, is not substance, is not there. You have to unsee the ear in order to replace that ear. As long as you think it's there in the first place, you will never replace it. As long as you think an evil is present, you can never dispose of it. The only one who could see the non-existence of the human ear was the spiritual master. Now, you can understand it when we put it into points of light, invisible, not visible to human perception, and our reaction to those invisible points of light becomes the visible ear. That's understandable. And you can see how you can move an image in mind around so that once it's off and once it's on, once you're falling and once you're standing and not falling, the moment you touch Christ within, you are restored. And when Christ within touches you, it is the same as you touching Christ within. Now the miracle of Malchus's ear points up something that can only be done by one who is willing to see that Malchus wasn't there, let alone Malchus's ear. Only Christ sees Christ. Only Christ stood there, not Malchus. There was no ear to be severed, no ear to be restored, and only one who can accept that Christ stands where Malchus seems to be is in Christ consciousness. Now then, we who are 
trying to build that skyscraper could only build it on the foundation that wherever Malchus appears, he isn't. Wherever his ear appears, it isn't. You must see Christ where all around you the world see Malchus. You must see Christ wherever you look. And you will not see Christ with your eyes, so you must see Christ with your soul. You must see Christ on faith, and then you must let that faith deepen into the experience that Christ is there where the world sees Malchus with a torn ear. Now, there's another example in the Bible. If anyone can tell you to go a mile, go with him twain. And this was one of the earlier principles established by the Master. To go with him twain if he compels you to go a mile. And this was just like saying fish on the other side of the boat. If you don't catch fish on the material side, fish on the spiritual side. And this going twain with him is precisely what the Master did in the Garden of Gethsemane when Malchus's ear was cut off. He went twain with him. Twain means that two become one. And so the Master sees Malchus and two become one. They go twain. The two become one when the Master says, that isn't Malchus at all. That's the invisible Christ of my own being. That's going twain. When someone compels you to go a mile, in other words, when you are in some way pressured by a circumstance, when you are in some way persecuted by a condition, when you are in some way limited by an appearance, go twain with it. See through the Malchus of it to the invisible Christ of it on faith, on the acceptance that there is only the invisible spirit. And then you have taken the two, yourself and the external condition, and made them into one invisible spiritual being. You've gone twain with your adversary. This is how you agree with your adversary. To go twain with it. And you must build a foundation of going twain with this world around you. So that I would like to know that every student of the infinite way knows that he can and must go twain with his environment. He must look out and no matter what he sees he must accept that there and here of the one spirit and so you go twain with all you see that is how you create the two in my name wherever there are two in my name I am in the midst of them and so when I look at you I must see that there are two here in my name there must be the one that is Christ where you are the one that is Christ where I am those are the two and they are in my name which is Christ and so the method of Jesus there was to see two in my name now that could have been unemployment instead of Malchus's ear it could have been a physical disability in another part of the body it could have been any human condition any human malfunction and the moment you look at it and know that there invisibly is the Christ and here invisibly is the Christ you have found the two in my name and there is Christ in the midst of them you have gone twain with the condition or the adversary you have accepted one where two appear and this is the purpose of showing the great power 
of being able to unsee the visible in your knowledge that the Spirit of God is everywhere. Then, for you, every human condition, whether it's as serious as the losing of an ear, or more serious or less serious, all is symbolized by restoring Malchus's ear. You have the power to do it, simply by knowing that here is the invisible Christ, there is the invisible Christ. Where I see the ulcer and feel the ulcer, no, there is the invisible Christ. Where the heart attack threatens, no, there is the invisible Christ. We must build our firm foundation that only the invisible Christ is present, regardless of the forms, the faces, the sounds, the sights, and the appearances. Now then, others have said to me, somehow we learn the truth and we know the truth to an extent but what do we do precisely at the time that our problem is so great that we don't know what to do when we're frantic when we can't even think straight now usually that is said by those who have not practiced building a foundation of truth in the Christ way the foundation isn't built by memory. You know, quite a number of people go home and study their notes and memorize them, and they think they're building a foundation, and they're not. The only reason we have mentioned this again and again is because those notes mean nothing until they are in your consciousness. When you have taken the time to build the consciousness required by those words, and you can, without wavering, stand in the knowledge that only Christ is everywhere, that is all you ever really had to do. And everything we've been doing in the past nine years is to lead to the point where for you, the only being on the earth is the invisible Christ. Now, we want to develop out of the Christ miracles that capacity for us to put together firmly a foundation of principles that work. And again and again and again, we have reverted to stating and restating principles. Now we want to do something just a shade different. For those of you who have said, what shall I do at the moment when I can't seem to collect my thoughts? Here are nine or ten questions you can ask yourself. And the thing you can remember about this is that whatever confronts you if you will be honest with yourself about these nine or ten questions, it won't confront you very long. The first principle of these nine or ten questions that you ask yourself is this. You ask yourself nothing except the truth about God. If there is a single second when you ask yourself about you, you're not listening. And so the nine or ten questions we'd ask ourselves would run like this. And these should become part of your consciousness so that every form of error can be faced this way. Now let's say your tooth is putting up a heroic and dramatic role of telling you that unless that tooth is taken care of this minute, you're practically going to die. Or let us say a new pain has appeared. Or let us say uh, someone called this morning from uh, down the peninsula. Someone whose doctor told him three months ago he couldn't make it. And he's got a cancer in the lower intestine. Let's say that these things come up in our lives, in ourselves, in our friends, in our relatives, and people who know us. What are we going to do about it? 
I want everyone to know what to do. And now the first principle is ask yourself about God, only about God. Forget you, forget the person, forget how it hurts you, forget how it hurts the person, forget all of that. Go right to asking yourself questions about God. And ask yourself these questions. Where is God right now? I don't care what your problem is. Ask yourself, where is God right now? And you know what the answer has to be, or you're not in truth. If you can accept, without quibbling, that God is there and here, that God is where you are, where your house is, where your friends are, where your children are, where your parents are, that it doesn't matter where the problem's coming from, God is there, right there. That's your first question, where is God? And then ask yourself, what is God doing? And your answer would have to be, well, God's doing what God should do. God is being God. God is functioning. Then ask yourself, does God see this error, this problem, this evil, this terrible thing? It's always about God. Does God see that my business is down this month, that I haven't reached my sales quota? Does God see that my husband and I are on the rocks? Does God see that something new has developed in my physical system which is very disturbing? Ask yourself if God sees this. And then answer it and be sure to be honest that you know God does not see this. God is here and God is there. God is being God. God does not see this. Why does not God see this? Why doesn't God see that my business is down, that my marriage is going on the rocks? Why doesn't God see that I've got a, a great, terrible catastrophe happening in my body? And then your answer must be, because God only sees reality. Before you get to your ninth or tenth question, you've got all the answers, you see. But keep on asking new questions about God until you come to a place within yourself where you understand so well that God isn't seeing this, God is being God, and God isn't changing this, and God is here, and God has the power to do everything, finally it becomes clear to you that if God isn't going to do something about this now, there must be a reason. And the reason becomes fascinating to know and finally to believe. God only knows that there is a perfect universe everywhere. God only knows that I am perfect. God only knows that everything about me must be perfect because I am his child. And the more you continue asking yourself about God, the more you will expose the falsity of your belief. Your business isn't down. Your marriage isn't going on the rocks. You don't have a catastrophe in your body. Who are you talking about? All of your talking was about someone other than you. You were living in a false sense of self. God doesn't see your false sense of self. God doesn't improve your false sense of self. Who are you? And that is where you finally come.
after you've finished asking yourself about all that God is and what God is doing, don't stop at the four or five questions that I have asked. Ask more and more and more. Always confining yourself to God. Is God capable of permitting any imperfection in his universe? Is God closing one eye to let evil happen? Is God ever forsaking his child? Christ does not heal paralysis. Your foundation of truth must be that only Christ is present. Now when you say, who, where is God, and you say God is there where the paralytic is, that means there's no paralytic there. God is the only cause, the only creator, and God is not causing paralysis. Therefore, no one is causing it. There is no cause. It is an effect, a false effect of a false cause. Firmly now, there must come that level of consciousness so sharp that you are accepting God's presence as the only being, the only cause, the only substance, the only action, the only power, the only law, the only presence. You're keeping your thought on the nature of God. Now, Christ consciousness never strays from God. And unless you're building your consciousness around God, the moment you take it off, you're going to believe in the existence of a paralytic. The Christ and walk the earth as Jesus was never influenced by any visible phenomenon. The Christ in you, which is your only being, is never influenced by any visible phenomenon. And so you can not be influenced by a visible phenomenon or your foundation will crumble. Now then build your consciousness so that whatever you see, form, condition, person, thing, object, you are always going twain, accepting only the invisible I am there and where you are. <laughs> Maybe we should look at this paralytic. There is one in Matthew. It's in several others. We start at Matthew 9, verse 2. Behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, meaning they brought the man to him, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Again, he didn't bandage the wounds. He didn't think perhaps we ought to amputate. He didn't say, get out the adrenaline. You'll notice that the method of the Christ healing is never physical aid for a physical being. This is a permanent fact. There is no physical aid given. He didn't even put the ear on the other man physically. And so the Christ of your being is capable of healing without giving physical aid. In fact, the moment you try to give physical aid, you are in the illusion of physicality. 
Now then, Christ is standing where you are, and only Christ. Or, you're not in a position to move higher into other realms of self. You're looking not at a paralytic, you're looking at the invisible spirit of God. And that means you apply this to all conditions in your life. There is no paralytic there. There are no conditions in your life. There'd be no point in these biblical miracles unless we were to derive from them the absolute truth that they are giving to us. There is no paralytic victim there. There is only a spiritual universe, and this is the consciousness of the Christ. You are living in your spiritual universe, and all that comes to you physically is forgiven, erased in consciousness, not accepted. Now you will notice a strange thing happening here. The reason there is no physical aid given to the victim is because Christ in you never treats a symptom or an effect. Christ in us only treats cause. You never see, treat the effect. And wherever you see one treating the effect, they are not giving a Christ treatment. The Christ treatment is to treat the cause. The cause is never the body. The cause of no condition is a material cause. All cause is false and all cause is contained only in the viewing consciousness. The consciousness that views the error is the false cause. And if we were to study 50 of the miracles of the Bible, you would discover that they are all one false cause. They're really one illusion with many names, and they all emanate from one cause that is false. And that false cause is called sin. And that sin is the violation of the first commandment. When you are not violating the first commandment, you will discover that all cause of evil is eliminated. If your business seems down, it's because you're violating the first commandment. If your back hurts, it's because you're violating the first commandment. If you're worried about this or that or the other, or if you don't know what to do about this paralytic in front of you, you're violating the first commandment. It all comes back to not knowing that only spirit is present. That is the first commandment. To acknowledge me in all thy ways is to know that only spirit is present. There's no such thing as a bad spiritual business or a bad spiritual fact or a bad spiritual disease or a bad spiritual marriage whenever you're behaving on a human level you're under the material laws of humanhood you're violating the first commandment only spirit is and if you intend to move into what we call the fifth plane the world of the soul, you won't do it by violating the first commandment. You've got to iron out all beliefs in you that think in terms of bad physicality, bad physical conditions. There are no such things in the consciousness of one who walks in the kingdom of heaven on earth. So we have no paralytic here, 
Rather, we have the Christ, the Spirit of God, which appears to man's material sense as a man called Jesus. And we have a another individual who is the invisible Christ, appearing to man's physical senses as a paralytic. But the Spirit of God called Christ realized where Christ Jesus is knows that the Spirit of God is where the paralytic is. He accepts the first commandment which he has given us. Acknowledge me in all thy ways. Acknowledge my Spirit as the only presence in all thy ways. Acknowledge my Spirit as the only presence in your home, in your business, in all your relationships. And do not stop until you have reached the place where you can say that is true that is what I am doing or else your visitation from the higher level of consciousness is going to be delayed now this paralytic is instantly faced with a statement son be of good cheer thy sins be forgiven thee now what sins that he committed that Christ would know that quickly? What sins have you committed that you still have difficulties of any kind? They're just the same sins as we all have committed. One sin. That's the only sin there is. The belief that there is something beside the Spirit of God. That's how we violate the first commandment. And there is nothing beside the Spirit of God. Therefore, all these things that appear as the sins of an individual all stem from that fundamental ignorance that only the Spirit of God is here. And these are the sins that are forgiven. How are they forgiven? Not by the words. And that is the meaning of treating the cause and not the effect. Christ has treated this individual by removing this individual's belief in a material world. He hasn't treated the paralytic victim. He has recognized the invisible Christ who lives only in spirit. He has lifted up the eye by recognition. He is walking only with God. He is reconciling this individual. He is going twain with him. But this is what we're to do. And so we are ironing out every wrinkle in our lives by the recognition that there can be no material conditions where there are no material forms. Your five questions to yourself are, who are you? Are you the child of God? Are you Christ? Is Christ perfect? Are you perfect? And only your correct answers to those five questions will establish for you the consciousness that I am the perfect child of God called Christ here and now. And therefore, these conditions whatever they may seem to be, are not happening in the perfect child of God, Christ, that I am here now. Therefore, they do not have any part of my being. They have no reality. They're not in God. They're not happening. They are simply not happening because only Christ is happening. Now, that's the consciousness we want. And that knowledge that only Christ is happening is the same as thy sins be forgiven thee. It's just saying it another way. In the consciousness that the perfect Christ is all that's here, the sins, the inability to know identity is removed and the higher consciousness stands there, recognized and accepted 
and this is the erasure of the mind that was not in Christ Jesus leaving nothing on the scene but the Christ mind it's really a spiritual shorthand a quick penetration to remove the false thought of the individual not by using mental power over the individual but by knowing the truth only the mind of Christ is there because only the Christ is there only the mind of Christ is here because only the Christ is here again to a more in my name rest in the word and in your conscious awareness of the truth it externalizes through the paralytic who has come to the Christ to be seen as he is and not as he appears to be. And so if we were to develop principles of the Christ healing, we would have to say that Christ in you never sees evil, never accepts evil. Christ in you accepts only God's presence. Christ in you accepts that God is functioning perfectly that the power of God is present and functioning and there can therefore be no paralytic present where the power of God is functioning that knowledge within you is the same as saying verbally thy sins be forgiven me so all this inner work is going on and then the visible man says thy sins be forgiven me behold certain of the scribes said within himself this man blasphemeth Jesus knowing the thought said wherefore think ye evil in your hearts for whether is it easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say arise and walk what's the difference if you know the truth or if you say something visibly if you know the truth the man will get up and walk and if you say get up and walk it won't mean anything if you don't know the truth within yourself and so one is the same as the other but the words are meaningless the words are not the power it's the consciousness that knows there is no paralytic there there is no paralytic here there is Christ there is no unemployment there it appears to be just like there appears to be a paralytic there's no broken marriage it appears to be like there appears to be a paralytic there is no defect of any nature it appears to be like there appears to be a paralytic there is no lack or limitation the paralytic there was just as clear to the human eye as any condition you will ever face in your life and your conditions are just as unreal and unhappening as the paralytic was unreal and unhappening there Arise, pick up thy bed and walk. Why? You're not a paralytic. You are the invisible spirit of God. You're not a material condition. How can there be such a condition if there's no matter there to have a condition? And of course, to the mind untrained in these things, it says, well, that's ridiculous. He blasphemeth or he's insane he doesn't know what he's talking about then says he to the sick of the palsy arise take up thy bed go unto thine house now that I've lifted you out of the false consciousness of being a mortal paralytic try to understand and live in that house or consciousness of who you really are Now the line before that says but that ye may know that the son of man hath power on earth to forgive sin 
Arise, take up thy bed. The Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin. Your Christ self realized removes all violations of the first command. You see how it all revolves then on you accepting yourself to be the Son of Man. For the Son of Man is a divine expression appearing invisibly as the self of you and me and him and her. And in that acceptance, it is saying to the world, Arise, pick up thy bed. You don't voice it, it does. And so again, adding to our principles, Christ in you is the focal point of your demonstration of building a consciousness of truth. Christ in you accepts only the presence of God without an opposite. Christ in you accepts only a spiritual universe. Christ in you does not accept a material universe. Christ in you does not accept conditions of matter. Christ in you does not accept laws of matter. Christ of you does not accept any activity of a material nature as being real. And until this is practiced and established, our capacity to move into higher worlds is limited. We cannot gain entrance into the fifth plane of existence as material beings for the only self there is in the fifth plane is the Christ. Christ accepted here in the fourth plane becomes our entry into the fifth plane. In other words, while on the fourth, the fifth plane is experienced when you accept and practice Christ, not only as your being, but as the being of all you see. Now, you cannot correct God. The moment you correct another individual, you're really correcting God. The moment you improve another individual, you're trying to improve God. The moment you condemn another individual, you're condemning God. You're not accepting what is there when you condemn or correct or improve. You may seem to be making headway, but you're violating the first commandment and you will pay the price. Secondly, if there is another individual that you do not accept in Christ, then you are not in Christ. And so all of our work now to establish a firm foundation of truth is all about Christ and about God. There's really not anything else that we have to consider. Either you are Christ and the world around you is the invisible Christ, or we're not in the spiritual message. 